Hello, everyone. My name is David Reed. Welcome to Dial the Gate. Episode 133, Catherine Powers, writer and season one executive story consultant for Stargate SG-1. I have been looking forward to this episode for a long time. Catherine is someone I have uh, gotten to know over a number of years, and we've been wanting to sit down and do an interview, so uh, it came into this. This is going to be, even though it's this has a video feed, it's an audio interview, um, I just wanted to respect Catherine's uh, privacy, and she is she is in her later years, so this is how we wanted to present the material. Um, but uh, interspersed in this video are some images that she supplied to me, so you may want to continue to watch, or you can just listen to it if you prefer. Um, so I'm really excited about this because it's not this this interview is a Stargate interview, but it's more uh, just to prepare you an interview about her and her life experience as as a uh, woman writer uh, in the industry. So she has a lot to say going back several decades of, of experience. There were some interesting revelations in this interview, I can uh, certainly tell you that. And um, some of the things that she says may not entirely be of your perspective, but I encourage you, as I have done with her, to keep an open mind and enjoy the interview. But before we get into any of that, if you like Stargate and you wanna see more content like this on YouTube, it would mean a great deal to me if you click that like button. It makes a difference and will help the show grow its audience. Please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend. And if you wanna get notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. And giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops and you'll get my notifications of any last minute guest changes. And clips from this episode will be released over the course of, uh, the next uh, few weeks on Gate World, as well as our summer hiatus season, which will be uh, approaching uh, fairly soon here, uh, if all goes according to plan. This is a pre-recorded episode, so the moderators will not be taking questions uh, for Catherine. Uh, if we do uh, manage to have her back, that's that's something uh, that I will consider doing, a live show with her. Um, but as of right now, uh, this is what we have. A lot of the questions about her specific episodes will be, drumroll please, answered in commentary form. So we're going to be bringing in episode commentaries featuring writer Catherine Powers for her episodes later on this summer. We recorded three or four. And so a lot of specific questions about the Tolan, some about the Asgard will be answered in those uh, episodes. So this is a much more general overview. I hope you enjoy the interview and uh, I'll see you once it's over. My name is David Reed for dial the gate and i am privileged to be uh here with someone whom i have gotten to know over the past um i would say seven eight years now yeah. at this point Catherine powers uh she is the executive story consultant of stargate sg1 and a writer of some of the most memorable uh, episodes in the series. It is a privilege to be here with you. You are a pioneer in this. <laughs> she's 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 hand gesturing a heart to me right now. <laughs> you are a, a pioneer in this industry for uh, women writers. And I think that it's... Uh, I, I think that you have a, a heck of a story to tell. You are also someone who has forced me to evaluate how I uh, perceive the world and um, has not necessarily changed any specific core beliefs of mine, but you have taught me to keep an open mind because you are a medium. And one of the things that we're going to get into is that story of how you became who you are and how you find your way in your work through these layers of reality that you experience. You're one of the more <laughs> unique people that I've ever encountered. So thank you for, in for agreeing to sit down with me. Oh, and thank you for noticing. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and not objecting. <laughs> no, absolutely. I, I think that, but this is all about this is all a part of what makes you you and your gifts to the world are reflected in who you are as a person. So let's let's go right in there from the top. Who is Toph? 
Who is Toth? Toth. Oh, Toth. Yes. Well, his real name is Atoch. Okay. Most people who are listening now will recognize Toth as uh, an Egyptian god who was actually Anubis's scientist in season seven of the series. But as according to you, that is not the case at all. <laughs> so I'm starting here because this is this is a foundation of someone um, whom you have communicated with since you were a child. Yes. Around three or four, he showed up. And he'd show up and then... Like disappear. in person or in, like, you would, you would just be aware of a presence? No, no. I saw him perfectly. Uh, my grandmother was an RN nurse. My grandfather was a doctor, okay? He was even a police surgeon for a while here in L.A. Um, and I remember <laughs> very well, uh, Toth would show up. And from the time I was about three or four, I remember the first time I saw him, I was out back because I lived with my mother, my grandmother, and my great-grandmother, all of them incredible women, strong women. Um, but I loved my great-grandmother and called her best. <laughs> so everybody else started calling her best. I was out back picking berries in springtime when I was three or four years old because we used to have bottled milk delivered with cream at the top. So I'd always go out when the berries came out because I could go and get the cream off the top on the berries and some sugar and oh, was it so good. Well, I was out back picking berries and I got a, a, phys a physical looking sort of like that Ghosts uh, movie and series that they did on TV where okay. you can see through the people. They're dead, but okay. they're alive. You know, they're ghosts. Okay. So you kind of see through them, but you see them in full body, you know. Anyway, so I see this presence. It clicks in and clicks out. So anyway, so my grandmother had done her laundry for her uniforms, and she was ironing her uniforms. Oh, and this is still when I was three or four years old and I was keeping her company and all of a sudden, pop. And I said, oh, there's my new friend, Grandma. She turned around and looked and laughed and said, oh, you have such a great sense of, sense of, um, you imagination. have a great imagination, great imagination. That was luck because they didn't go to church every Sunday and tell me I was worshiping the devil. <laughs> but, yeah, and, and, you know, so that was interesting. And after she said that, I looked back at him. He was standing behind her, and he went... She's putting her finger over her mouth as to be quiet. Over my smiling mouth. <laughs> And that's Smiling what he mouth. was doing. He smiled, and it's like, don't talk about me. <laughs> what did he look like? Did he look like a man? Did he look like... He looked like a human mm -hmm. man. It was years until I saw them in their true form. One of, well, forms, because the most interesting one was a sheet of golden light that moved like waves very slowly back and forth wow and when that happened i said well you know wh why did you always appear before as a human and um he said oh well you just weren't ready for the truth and i said well i'm ready now and he said well why don't you get some pictures of dolphins <laughs> so i did and kept them around a species that used to walk on land. Yes. But. <laughs> uh, you know, that was a picture they thought would be easier for me to understand. And not get upset in any way. I don't know why they thought I'd get upset. Because I've always loved the unusual. So. It just shows they don't know everything. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you also shared a an early story with me we've had conversations about the Asgard 
in the show. You had an encounter that was not too friendly. Um, where you were a little bit older, I believe. And this was, in, I think, at your grandparents' place in the summer. And you perceived a, a threat from these beings that you would relate to as, I believe, a Roswell Gray, if I'm not mistaken. No. Okay. Actually, I found a picture in one of my history books on the Mayan. I found a picture that looked exactly like these guys looked. Okay. And what happened was I was uh, visiting an aunt, a great aunt and uncle's farm in Minnesota for the summer. I turned five that summer. Okay. And I loved going out and talking to the cows when they were bringing them into the barn. And, you know, they'd first, they'd kind of, it, if there was any daylight left, you know, they would be feeding the animals. Right. And uh, so I talked to the cows while they went into the barn. And then my great aunt was had her an apron on with seeds in it, and she was throwing the seeds in the air. Um, and they were feeding the chickens on the right. ground. And uh, all of a sudden, she threw seed up in the air, and it went, stopped. Everything the seed st in midair. In midair. It just all stopped. And I felt something moving behind me. I turned around, and it was a, sh a round ship, a spaceship, that was probably not quite as maybe as wide, but maybe would take up half this room. So maybe and seven or eight feet in diameter? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And it landed, and a door opened, slid open, and two figures came out and grabbed one arm and then the other arm, and they're pulling me toward the spaceship. This was the year I turned five in the summer. Did your family see this? No. Okay, you were alone. I was, I was, no, I was around people that were doing things and okay. everything stopped. Okay. Everything. So they're frozen. Yes, they're frozen. I understand. Yeah. And all of a sudden I see this spaceship and these people come out and I, it was only, I think a year ago, I was looking through the Mayan book that I have and I found a picture that, because they weren't the little guys who were white with you know like thor is depicted exactly yeah and i told them that that was not exactly a happy people to come in but they were mad. you mean jonathan glassner and yeah. and yeah. okay and they didn't like me telling them that it was not a friendly being because they that's the direction they wanted to go in with, exactly. the, with the roswell grays yes i see uh but it worked out okay you know, right. It's their show. Of course. <laughs> they do get it. into that later on in the series that, yes, they have come to Earth and experimented on us. It turns out to be Loki that was responsible for that, believe uh, it or not. But So they do, they do answer that, that yeah. not all of them are of the same ilk. But your experience certainly was not a pleasant... How did you get away? Toth. Toth. Boom, was there. And telling them they had better let me go because they were going to get in a lot of trouble bringing me home to their people. The people they worked for were going to not like this. And it was going to cost them. So whoever was abducting you answered to an authority. Yes. And they left. He saved me from being stolen. <laughs> and I've got a book um, on the Mayan and there's photographs in there well for some reason I had not noticed this one particular photograph I, I guess I was reading or I don't know what but <laughs> about a couple of years back I noticed the photograph and I realized that the facial qualities were 100% so, were the Mayan people uh, 
did they come from outer space? You know, I mean, it really asked, it, it was very interesting. We're talking about an advanced civilization for the time. Yes, very advanced. Um, and it may have been, what I picked up was that it was a time of um, very strong sun output. And people were having trouble getting pregnant. Um, you mean the, the, it, during the Mayan era? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And f I, I mean, it's crazy as it sounds, what I was getting is that they actually had been space travelers. <laughs> you know, and nobody had ever noticed that. <laughs> so I think, okay, well, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've had a lot of weird stuff happen. You believe that um, that we were seeded here on this planet by another civilization, is that right? Yes. Okay. I do. And I think we were created not as it says in the Bible in Genesis, you know, that we were created by this loving God who put us in a beautiful garden, you know, and gave it to us and then got pissed off and kicked us out. You know, most people don't look at that part. Um, Who are the Kadi? The Kadi are Atos people. Toth's people? Yes. So yeah. that is that is his race? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Did they bring us here? Are we there? Are we there? descendants no, in one fashion or we another? we were in fact um, created um, by the people who have that planet that goes around like a meteor in a okay. long elongated it, that only comes into our solar system once every 3,400 years. So we had just recorded a podcast for um, Enigma and we were discussing malevolent forces on Earth in relation to the likes of Colonel Mayborn and those who are working in some form of shadow government to, to maintain certain status quos of chaos. And so, oh, you, that is so perfectly. Oh, stated. thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, there. So they they brought us here and yeah. and they fiddle with us, us at their at their They created pleasure. us for slave help. They didn't create us out of love. They wanted free workers. And I mean, when they built, in Sumer, when they built these beautiful temples in the middle of the cities that they were building, I mean, humans start building cities that can hold 300,000 people overnight? I don't think so. <laughs> Doesn't make any and sense. And agriculture? Yeah. Independently and, created how many yes, times on Earth? Yes. So yes. six, seven it is a lot. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty sophisticated equation. And, and the very complicated um, watering systems that mm -hmm. they put in, that they created. That, that, that humans don't learn how to do that overnight, but the, it happened overnight in Sumer, you know. Mm -hmm. Mesopotamia, Mes Sumeria. Yeah. 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 Cuneiform yeah. was the written language yes. then at that point. So according to Daniel... Um, Hang on a second. Sure. So I, I'll display this. This is a um, this is a, a reproduction of a, of a cuneiform uh, tablet. I think. Yes. Do you know what this says? No. It's they beautiful. Didn't send, they didn't send what it said. I see. <laughs> it was a gift from one of my daughters. Oh, I understand now. Okay, yeah. it's beautiful. Because they pretty much know yeah. I have books on everything. Yes, you do. <laughs> Catherine, you broke through a very impenetrable glass ceiling in this industry as a female writer. I, I'm looking at Fantasy Island, Charlie's Angels, Wonder Woman, um, Logan's Run, The Waltons. I mean, we're talking uh, decades and of material. And don't forget Kung Fu. Kung Fu. Westerns. Yeah. Um, Star Trek. Star Trek. Uh, and Star Trek Next Generation. I and DS9. Yeah. Yep. 
DS9. And this little show called Stargate SG-1, I think. Uh-huh. <laughs> How did you do it? And I had a good agent. You had a good agent. Yeah. But I had to go in and pitch and get sold. You know, he opened the doors for me. But I did the work. So. What is the resistance to female writers? Is it just a different uh, uh, perception? A di- is it uh, needs are different? I mean, you you and I just had a conversation where you were you were talking about um, dressing like a man. Uh huh. Partly because you fit the clothing well, like in, you have long arms, so you fit the jackets well. Yeah. Not taking in purses, but taking in briefcases. A lot of this is functional for you as a person. And some of it is more to fit in. Absolutely. More was to that, fit in. What was that like dealing with that? Well, I go in to meet a new staff, okay? For an example, you mean? Yeah, okay. for example, I go in, meet a new staff, a new show, go in to pitch. I never wore a dress. I wore men's jackets. Uh, the only thing I wore that was... at Vaguely feminine was a very simple gold necklace. That was it. I did never wore high heels. Um, I didn't even have a dress in my closet for probably thirty years because I just didn't wear them. Mm-hmm. I'd go in, I'd sit down, and I would wait for the right moment to say, "Well, fuck that." And every and all the guys would go. Oh, we don't have to be careful around this one. She's like us. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> every new meeting, and it always worked. And when I was working on oh, what was it? A Warner Brothers show. I can't remember, but we were all going to lunch, and um, the one of the writer producers um, was walking kind of behind me we're going to go out to lunch together the, the staff and talk about a show that was you know being worked on and he pinched me in the ass when we were going through my office door so I laughed and I reached around and pinched him in the ass and said, Oh, no wonder you guys like to do that. It's really fun. He never touched me again. I was working on, um, what was that show? Was it Fantasy Island? Um, the Plane, The Plane. Yeah, and who was the star? Ricardo Montalban. Ricardo Montalban. Gentlemen's gentlemen. Yes. Well, wait till you hear my Montalban story. <laughs> um, and I was working on staff on that show. Um, and uh, he wanted me to come over to his trailer just to talk about uh, some notes on the script we were just starting to do, starting to film. And he grabbed me and stuck his tongue in my mouth. Ricardo? Yes. And I laughed and I said, oh, Ricardo, that is a kiss I will always remember. But you're married. I'm married. We love our mates. So, and I, you know, was not asked to come back. I'm so surprised to hear this. Wow. This is what women put up with. I mean, I walked into a new show, and, you know, my agent set up a meeting with this new show. And I walked in, and there was a guy sitting, like, in a front office, and um, obviously a, a lower producer writer, okay, because the bigger office was behind his, with somebody more important looking. And... Uh, <laughs> I sit down and I've, you know, I always came up with three stories to tell. And it worked pretty well. Usually they'd pick one. Of the three pitches. Yeah, of the three pitches. 
That's a lot of work to do for nothing. Yeah. You know? Um, and also, the more you wrote and the more credits you had, if you were a man writer, you started getting money beyond the base. If you're a woman writer, you never got to go beyond that base, ever. And I've talked with other woman writers here and there, very few. Um, I remember a Western, I don't remember which one. Um, but I mean, I have a lot of credits. You can actually. say that again. And they're all different kinds of shows. Mm -hmm. And they're action shows, westerns, things like kung fu. Um, I didn't want to write love stories. I was bored to death by love stories. Um, and I was hired once to do an MOW. Movie of the week. Movie of the week um, for television about women in prison. It's like, oh my God. God, and then I had another one that I got hired to do um, about, um, give me a minute here, wives of baseball wives, baseball <laughs> stars, but oh my God, I've always- She's a woman, she'll be good at this. Yes, exactly, <sighs> I hated it. I couldn't have been more bored by it. And I had to call in my ex-husband, one of my three ex-husbands. Um, I had three husbands and three daughters, one by each one. <laughs> and they're all really interesting, wonderful girls. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> but, um, oh, anyway, I walk into this new show and I start talking to the guy and he says, well, you know, um, he, he started talking like I was a person with no credits. So I open my briefcase, not my purse, and I pull out my... CV. Yeah. I say, well, maybe you should take a look at this. And he takes a look at it and goes, you wrote all this? And I said, didn't my agent tell you? He said, yeah, but I didn't believe him. Oh, and I got sake. up and walked out. Yeah. I mean, it was so insulting. I was just, I walked out. And I called my agent and I said, I'm really sorry, but I can't, I just, that's too much. <laughs> Did you really write this? No, I made it up. <sighs> so, it was not an easy path to tread. I think we can all agree that we still have a long way to go. But when you look at um, creatives like you know Amanda Tapping, who is you know directing now and and doing what she always wanted to do, and is I think uh, or Heather Ash, who also worked on on Stargate. I think I think um, I think you set. A, uh, you helped, you helped break that glass ceiling, for a lot of other women who have come since. I hope so. I hope so. I I remember one of my daughters was out having dinner with a friend. <clears throat> who? Let me see. There was a guy there who. <clears throat> who had um, his own private uh, come to my come to my place and learn how to write for television. A workshop. A workshop, yeah. And my daughter, and I do have a daughter who was a very um, well-paid and successful young actress in movies and television. Her name is Alexandra Powers. She took my last name. <laughs> All my girls have taken my last name, except my middle daughter. She took Montgomery for a last name. I have no... <laughs> I don't know where she got it, but she likes it, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you 
you know, you have to, you have to, what is it that Toth always would tell me? You have to honor a person's self-drive. Don't try and make them do something they don't want to do. Encourage them to do what they do want to do, even if you see it's going to be bad for them to do it. <laughs> because living is learning. Life is it's a great It's an opportunity teacher. to learn. Yeah. yeah. Life is a great teacher. And knowledge is power. <laughs> Those are two things I've always said. You know, study history, study, keep growing your knowledge because that's a powerful thing. Um, <clears throat> I wish these women today would get over themselves because <laughs> they're going around becoming powerful women by being victims. <laughs> I just don't get it. I don't get it. Even I have one of my daughters who gets mad at me if I talk like that because she likes to complain about a lot of stuff. Oh well. <laughs> That's what she wants to do. You never played the victim card in your years of doing this business though. No, never. I, I dressed in a way that men would feel comfortable with um, because women who came in with high heels and dresses on were their secretaries, not their writers. Yeah. Didn't have any equality. I, I think that that's the thing. I think, you know, in terms of what I am hearing, in terms of the stories that you have told me, you're not trying to circumvent. You're trying to be an equal. You're not trying to topple anyone else. You're yeah. trying to come alongside and say, let's do this great thing together. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If, if men are to give a little, maybe women should give a little too. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I always try and do that seed planting. <laughs> right, planting a seed, you know, hoping for something to grow, an idea, yeah. you know. And don't expect it to grow, just plant it. Right. And your, hope your the job sun is comes to plant. Out. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was, Catherine and I were talking earlier. I, I forget who it was who said it, uh, but uh, uh, plant seeds uh, uh, for the future, who's, uh, uh, what was it? The, the, um, whose shade they know they will never sit beneath. So I like that. Yeah. 1996. Jonathan Glasner and Brad Wright have each gone to MGM to propose a series based on the Stargate movie from 1994. At this point, they're in production of, I believe, uh, two, se two or three seasons of The Outer Limits up at Bridge Studios in Vancouver in Burnaby, British Columbia. Had you seen the film at this point? Which one? Stargate. Yes. Did you see it in the theater? Yes. What are your thoughts? I thought it was really intriguing. I thought it was... I loved it. There was something about it, though, that was a little off-putting for me. I don't know what it was. Um, but I liked the series much more than I liked the movie. It was because it was developed, I guess. You know, the stories were... Rounded out. Yeah. You were brought in before any of the cast were cast, is that correct? Or did you come a little bit later? I, I wrote a piece called Emancipation. Okay. And that got me the job. Because what I did was, I saw that there was... Um, Amanda Tapping was her name mm -hmm. on the team and I thought I'm going to write and show that she's a soldier as well as a woman and that's what I wrote <laughs> and Emancipation um, I mean I have it I don't know if you saw it but that's what got me the job Mongol culture is explored in that episode. Yes. And, and I did a lot of research. I did a lot of research. And I still have something I shouldn't have. <laughs> Illustrations. Uh, yes. Yeah. From the art department. Yeah. 
and a picture of the cast yep. in front of the Stargate. I don't know if you've gone down. I have. Hall. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're recording. You know that, right? Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Okay. It's been a long time. <laughs> I'm probably living longer than most of them. <laughs> I'm 78. Uh, I'll be 79 in July. So Emancipation got you um, the staff position. Yes. For season one. Yes. You were in L.A. at the time? I went up to Canada, and he went up with me. Being, um, so we're talking snarky, snarky number one. one. Yep. So you relocated to another country for this show. Yes. Was this the first time you had done this for a show? Yes. Why? Did you believe that passionately in, in the project, or was this, I mean, that, that's a big move. You yes, know? it is. And considering the number of credits that you've had before, you know, what is it about Stargate that just consumed and enthralled you? Well, I was on staff of a really interesting show. I think that kind of every show was planting seeds for people. And it was well cast. It was beautifully done. I mean, that the Enigma, for example, I mean, the opening scene when they come through the Stargate. Pompeii. You know, and it's Pompeii, you know. And I have a book that talks about Pompeii and what happened and that everybody suffocated when they did the dig to uncover it. They found that everybody had suffocated before the... Uh, um, the lava started the flowing. The lava started flowing. You know. <laughs> Tell me about working with Brad and Jonathan and Rob Cooper and you know these. I mean, these these writers that have been producing. Uh, several of them have been producing science fiction for years. Uh huh. Um, tell us about that that year that you were on staff up there. Well, I thought that they were the most wonderful people to work for. Problems developed. I already had chronic fatigue syndrome. As a matter of fact, I won a California, and I still have it, a special thing for people who are ill or mm -hmm. crippled who manage to keep working in the business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a special thing, not given by the business, mm -hmm. but... Um, I had chronic fatigue syndrome and I had to spend every weekend in bed to get through the week. And I couldn't let them know that. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I talked about witchcraft and this and that and doing magic and I was exhausted. I didn't want them to see that I was sick. Yeah. So, you know, it was okay. And I still have two um, crocheted blankets that I made over the weekends. Friday night, I would go out, I would get enough tapes, because they were all tapes then. We didn't have DVDs yet. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I'd get enough tapes to last a weekend in bed crocheting. <laughs> and that got me through the next What were you week. watching? Anything. Okay. Movies. Okay. Yeah. Stuff to watch. Stuff to watch and crochet. I loved them because they seemed to be the nicest guys, you know, upper mm -hmm. producer guys that I had ever worked with. And that's saying a, a lot considering your list of credits. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but it's... Uh, I thought they were just the best in the whole world. The nicest, the easiest to work with. You are responsible for uh, helping to give birth to a number of important races. We've got, just for an example here, um, the Asgard. Um, you have the Tolan. And... Uh, there are, you know, when, when you really break down the nuts and bolts of SG-1, those two races are extremely important to the franchise. Uh, I you know, must thank you for contributing to their creations, regardless of how they turned out in the end, you know. Um, 
they are very important to the fabric of the franchise and very key to to everything in my work. So thank you for helping to to create those voices. Well, thank you for noticing. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> so you returned to L.A. after the end of season one. Yeah. And then you continued writing remotely from down here yes. for season two. Right. Okay. Yeah, at that point, I'm sure, you know, you have the system in place and, you know, it's, you're back in an environment that's, that's you know, more suited to your yeah. um, f- chronic fatigue syndrome that you yeah. can deal with and can contribute from there. Well, it's funny because I've had two oh, oh, years apart. I've had, and I don't even know, they've got to be somewhere in my files, but I've had two uh, birth charts done by really good um uh what do they call them people that take your birth date and work the stars out astrologists astrologists yeah yeah i have two different birth charts from two different really good astrologists and the first thing they both say is you are going to live your life and do your work in your home you are completely home centered by the stars and it was true and I loved it <laughs> that's what phones are for yeah <laughs> yeah tell me about um, automatic writing you'd mentioned it earlier in our discussion it's something how long have you been doing this and what is it I've been doing it since I was in my early 20s I was reading about what had happened in the 1930s in our country they got into um, trying to communicate with the dead and they were going to a lot of people who were just you know sending people to spy on them and you're then, talking about the military no not the military okay. this, this is people that claimed to be able to speak with the dead okay and they were just stealing from folks hundreds of dollars yeah, you go and they're all dressed up nice and they go into a thing. And oh, they're charlatans. Charlatans, yeah. Um, but there were these books, and I think I had at least one or two, maybe three. They were called the Betty Books, B-E-T-T-Y. And um, they were about psychics learning how to use real uh, ability to help people talk to dead relatives. But the Betty books were about automatic writing um, because they said it it took time, and it does take time. It took me a good two years before I could do it without anticipating what the rest of the sentence was going to be. Because that's your mind taking over, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, you have to really not let that happen. Mm-hmm. And it takes, it took me two years to get rid of it, to make it so that I could separate myself from my hand and allow my hand to be moved. And that's basically what it is. And I think I have one over here somewhere where from last year, year and a half ago, when he started automatic writing and talking to me that way because it's amazing it was i'll never forget that moment i was talking to otto you know and all of a sudden (laughs) something yanked my hand down and it was snorky and he talked to me almost every night and otto didn't get mad about it (laughs) it's like (laughs) handing the phone over to a kid yeah yeah (laughs) But not really, because he'd already lived two lives, you know, and Otto knew how much I missed him. Oh, oh, look at that. (laughs) Snarky three unk. Yes. What advice would you give to women writers today? I don't, I haven't been around the business. I don't like the new movies that are being made. I, I just, I don't like, uh, Sterling, my youngest daughter, worked for um, a composer, 
And what she has told me is that, you know, she still goes back and forth and talks to him because she worked for him for a number of years. Mm. And apparently what they're doing now for music, for the score of a film, is they just look at a bunch of different films. Oh, I want this scene. I want this scene. I want this scene. And they sew it all together and call it a score. You turn on a movie, Gunga mm-hmm. Dean. Gunga Dean, yes. We watched this movie. One of the greatest scores ever. I mean, there was, for the three guys <laughs> who fought together, there was, mu- there was music for that. There was mu- music for each individual guy. And there was Gunga Dean music. So, so whenever themes. You heard, you're talking about themes. Yes, Everyone themes. had a theme. Everybody had a theme. I mean, in all of these movies, everybody has a theme. And it's a great way of putting it. Um, well, it makes sense because the music, the music attaches is the to emotion. our emotional resonance yeah. of, a, of yeah. a group or a, an individual. Exactly. Or an idea. Yeah. So, you look at Star Wars, the Force theme... Da, 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 da. Yeah. I mean, it's Luke's theme, but it's 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 like it's, well, it's not really the Force theme, but it's it's the hero's journey. Yeah, and it Absolutely. all ties back to it. So, I mean, the stuff that they're coming out with now is just it it's has shit. It, it has very little soul. No, it doesn't. It's just snip, snip, snip. You know, tack it all together. Um, have one person, you know, in charge of creating a score who is not a composer and has no musical ability, and that's what you get. And it doesn't interest me at all. So what to change then? What, what to do about it? How, how do we get back on course with um, the right way of filmmaking, the right way of, of composing, the right way of creating content that matters to people. I don't think we ever will. Well, that's bleak. <laughs> well, maybe maybe some youth will come along cuz I'm hearing sort of stories about the very young starting to behave differently than the adults around in a positive way. So maybe It'll happen with a rebirth Mm. with younger people that can watch older movies and learn something from them. Mm. That's what I'm hoping. What do you want um, your Stargate work to say to people? What do you hope it's said to people who who have watched it and loved it? There's a, there's a different seed in each story. You know, you have to look at the people and the, how they're relating to each other. And, you know, because you, you, I try to, I, no, I think I do put a seed. I do seed planting in at least one scene or one speech or, you know, always there's something there. When we're talking seeds, we're talking ideas, like for, for deeper thought, right? Or um, action. It can be action, it can be dialogue, it's to show or inspire Mm -hmm. or open a gate, it's to plant a seed and hope it grows. And if you plant enough seeds, they'll start growing. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, I am looking forward to continuing to go through these commentaries with you and discussing more of these ideas. Oh, bless your heart, because and I need this inspiration right now. Absolutely. I need to get my great course out on, you know, writing a best-selling book. So but what's I coming need up to go next? beyond that. So what, what well, can those who, who have loved your work, uh, what can we expect next from Catherine Powers? i got to learn how to write books and get them published. Okay. And I think I finally found a company that can do it. And I have a friend up north, 800 miles, who's going to come down and help me get my house back together um, if I have to sell it, whatever I need to do. But he's going to help me. He knows the company I want to publish with. Um, 
for Moose Mountain. Okay, so I have sitting next to me here a manuscript called The Magic of Moose Mountain. Can you give us a... Well, actually, it has a better title than that. Okay. you got to open the book up. <laughs> you are a handful, dog. All right. A new hero myth of cave art, time travel, adventure, and magic. Can you give us the... The, the one paragraph pitch. Well, that's kind of it. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, that, that is very succinct. <laughs> yeah, it took me a while to come up with it, too. I can understand that. Because it's just the, the title, The Magic of Moose Mountain. But it's important, a new hero myth, because that is what I rewrote it to be. And I had a pub oh. And there's my dedication. You want to hear that? Mm -hmm. uh, dedicated to Chief Dan George of the Coast Salish tribes in North Van North yeah North Vancouver, Vancouver, Canada, British Columbia, a man I knew only by his moving performances in Little Big Man and Centennial. And the Ancient Warrior episode of Kung Fu, Season 1, 1973. And by his thoughtful book entitled My Heart Soars, in which he says, If you talk to animals, they will talk with you and you will know each other. If you do not talk to them, you will not know them. And what you do not know, you will fear. What one fears, one destroys. These words of ancient wisdom and the two beautiful drawings of moose by artist Helmut Hemschel, which accompany them, were the inspiration for this book. Never met him, but saw him from his work, and, his, and I have his book. Have I planted seeds? Well, I thank you for sitting down with me. Um, this this means a great oh, deal to I thank you too. have this conversation. And uh, here's here's too many more in dissecting the minutia of your individual episodes and um, and uh, sharing time with you and and looking forward to what you're developing in the future. Well, yeah. Can we actually watch some stuff together? Sure, absolutely. Wonderful. <laughs> We've got a snoring dog back here, so apologize, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. This is my sweetheart. Thanks so much to writer Catherine Powers for taking time to uh, record this interview. Uh, having her as a friend has been an interesting uh, journey, and it has never been boring. She is she is a unique individual, as as. Um, if, if unique, uh, if you look up unique in, in the dictionary, Catherine Powers is going to have a picture next to her. Before we go, if you've uh, liked what you've seen, uh, please consider clicking that like button. We have merchandise. Stargate, uh, Dial the Gate is brought to you every week for free, and we do appreciate you watching. If you want to support the show further, buy yourself some of our themed swag, including t-shirts, tank tops, sweatshirts, and hoodies for all ages, as well as cups and other accessories in a variety of sizes and colors at dialthegate.com. You can click on the merchandise tab in the form of, it just says merch. Uh, click on a specific design to see what items are being offered, and checkout is fast and easy. You can use your credit card or PayPal. Just go visit dialgate.com slash merch, and thank you so much for your support. I am out of town this week. This is why this is a recorded episode, but next week, the 14th of May at 12 noon Pacific time, episode 134, Stargate Science with Mika McKinnon and David Hewlett. Mika was the science consultant on Stargate Atlantis and Stargate Universe, and David was, of course, Dr. Rodney McKay, so be prepared for a show entirely focusing on the science background of Stargate. Come with your questions and prepare to uh, uh, have your ears open and and receive a download because Mika is full of science knowledge especially as it relates to what went on behind the scenes of the show and building out certain episodes and everything else she's a fascinating interview and that's uh, going to be coming up on the 14th of May. Then on the 21st of May at 12 noon Pacific time episode 135 Robert Murray Duncan he played Seth in season three of Stargate SG-1 
the episode Seth, and also Melbourne Jackson, Daniel's father, in season two's, what was that one? That one was, oh gosh, for heaven's sakes, The Gamekeeper. That's it. Took a minute, but it was in there with Dwight Schultz. Robert Murray Duncan will be joining us at 12 noon on the 21st of May, uh, 12 noon Pacific time, to discuss his time on Stargate SG-1 as, as senior uh, Dr. Jackson, and as Seth. My name is David Reed. Thanks so much for tuning in. I appreciate uh, everyone uh, who makes the show possible. My moderators, Summer, Tracy, Keith, Jeremy Reese, and Anthony, uh, Linda Gategabber fury Frederick Marcoux, my web developer, and Jeremy Heiner, our webmaster, keeping the site up to date. I appreciate you tuning in, and we'll see you on the other side.